Welcome to the Stone Choir Podcast. I am Corey J. Mahler. And I'm Woe. Today's episode is part four of our series on race and why it matters to us as a Christian church, why it matters in the world, why it's something that's real that has consequences that we can't ignore and that Satan isn't ignoring. Today's episode is specifically focusing entirely on IQ. Uh, We're going to do this in two parts, like many of our episodes. The first half of this episode, roughly, is going to talk about what IQ is, what it is roughly that it's measuring, how it works when you have you know people of, of different IQs that are markedly different. What does that mean? What, what does it mean when there's a significant difference between two individual men as far as their measured IQ? And we're going to give some personal examples. We're going to say some things are very gauche. I'm going to tell you what my IQ is, which is really offensive because that's like talking about how much money you make. Nobody does it. It's just, it's not socially acceptable. The reason that we're doing it in this episode is not to flex, it's not to brag, or to say, hey, we're really smart, you should listen to us. It's to give you a fixed point and space to relate your own experience to our experience and to help to illustrate how different people's experiences are in their lives. Because while we may be smarter than most of the people who are listening, and we'll talk about the statistics involved in that, there are people to whom you are significantly more intelligent. Any listener of this of this, epi- this podcast is to the same degree more intelligent than entire populations in the world. And that's why we're talking about it. Because when you're dealing with your everyday life, your everyday experience, most people you run into are average, because <laughs> that's how averages work. Most people are just normal. Outliers are precisely at that. There aren't that many of them, because that's how God situated things. God doesn't want a world full of geniuses. If he did, that's what he would have made. Instead, he wants a world full of normal people with outliers at either end, and there are consequences at both ends. So we're going to talk about how that interrelation works. And then the second half, we're going to talk about the other end, about when someone is significantly less intelligent than what we consider average. What are the consequences for the church? We've talked a little bit in past episodes about consequences of race on society. This one is specifically going to be focused on sharing the faith. Now, we're going to say this once up front, and we're going to say it probably a dozen times throughout this particular episode. Intellect has nothing to do with faith. Intellect has nothing to do with salvation. When we say one person has an IQ and another person has a low IQ, it has nothing to do with a person with a low IQ's ability to be saved. We'll talk about why that is and why it matters, but if at any point you think in your head or later on you hear someone describing what we have said and you conclude, oh, those guys think you have to be smart to be saved, it's a flat-out lie. We don't believe it. We're never going to say it. Frankly, the opposite is true. You are far more blessed if you are literally clinically retarded and you have faithful teachers and faithful pastors and faithful parents who explain things in the simplest, kindest way, and you just believe them. If you're retarded and you believe what you're told, and your teacher, your pastor, and your parent is faithful, that's ideal. That is the faith of a child. That's childlike faith. It's the smart people that screw things up. It's the smart people who invent the heresies that trick the average people because they make things complicated when they don't need to be. So none of this has to do with whether Jesus died for you. None of this has to do with whether you're human. None of this has to do with whether or not you can have saving faith. Completely excluded from this conversation. The reason we're talking about IQ is that it does pertain to the sustaining of the church. How is theology propagated across generations and across time? That is a question that requires intelligence. So that'll be the second half of this. To begin with, we're going to be talking a little bit about some statistics, uh, some numbers. I'm uh, going to ask you to visualize some things, but there are also going to be a, a number of charts uh, and graphs that will be embedded in the show notes for this this episode. I'd encourage you to read those. It's not homework, but it's just something to help understand what it is we're specifically talking about. Uh, a lot of this is going to center around the bell curve and what that means, so I think that's probably where we'll we'll kick this off. So to start off with the the bell curve, we'll add a an image of this in the show notes for anyone who cannot immediately picture what this is. If you did any sort of statistics or anything in that general field of math in school, you will know exactly what the bell curve is, exactly how to picture it. 
But the bell curve, what it actually is, is the normal distribution, the standard distribution, whichever one you want to call it. So if you take a population and map a particular attribute of that population mathematically, you're going to find essentially the standard distribution. When it comes to IQ for European populations, it happens to be 100 is the average. The standard deviation is 15 or 16, depending on a number of factors, the test used and the population being tested. But essentially how it breaks down is within one standard deviation, plus or minus, not both, you have 34% of the population within that one standard deviation up or 34% within one standard deviation down. So of course that's 68, which gives us the general rule, which is known as the 68 99.7 rule, which is that within one standard deviation plus or minus, you find 68% of the population. Within two standard deviations plus or minus, you find 95% of the population. And within three standard deviations, plus or minus, you find 99.7% of the population. And so when it comes to IQ, to give a more concrete example of that, you are going to have within 100 IQ and 145, the overwhelming majority of those who are above normal. And then, of course, 45 points down from 100, you're going to find the overwhelming majority of those who are below normal intelligence. And then above four standard deviations, you're only going to have 0.1% of the population. So, of course, 15 times 4, 60. So that's above 160. So those with an IQ of 160 are an extreme outlier because that's 0.1% of the population. We can talk more about the actual numbers here of what one in X would be for certain IQs, but that's the general overview of what a standard distribution is. It just gives you the various percentages, the likelihood, the probability of a given trait at a certain level in a given population. And that's what the visualization of the bell curve represents. If you have the X at the bottom, which for IQ in this example is the actual measure of IQ. It's basically what is the likelihood that a, a person with that particular score is going to exist in a population. So the reason that the bell curve is fat in the middle, as Corey just described, that's where most of the people are. That's where almost everyone that you meet is going to be somewhere in that center. And the closer you get to the center, the more likely it is that that will be the, the ability of someone. So the vertical, the y-axis and the bell curve is the, the thickness of the population that are at that point. And so you can sort of easily visually see almost everybody's in the middle, and that, that's all it means. And as, as you mentioned, it applies to numerous properties, uh, the intelligence to height, uh, weight. Uh, <laughs> if it were not for the modern diet, uh, that would be, there. there is a human norm for weight. Uh, it's kind of blown now because the Western diet is so completely polluted by poison that those numbers are completely insane. Uh, everyone is basically ob morbidly obese, well above average, uh, horrifyingly so. Um, and we need to get back to normal there. Like that's normal is a real thing. The IQ average for a European population is about 100. And that's not going to change because environment doesn't really move it too much. Uh, as I mentioned, we're not going to prove to you that IQ is valid. Uh, th the reason that IQ is an important subject is that it captures the aptitude of a person to deal with certain things in life. If you've heard discussion of IQ in the past, you probably heard attacks against it. You probably heard that, well, it's biased culturally or it's biased racially or this, that, or the other thing. It can't be valid. What they're telling you is the exact opposite of what you need to understand about it. IQ is basically the only useful, measurable, predictive instrument that has ever been produced in psychology. In the last 150 years, the only tool that actually has value is IQ. So the fact that in the current year, it is roundly rejected as being racist, if you have any sense and you're still listening to us at this point, 
that should make your ears perk up. And if they're saying it's racist, it's bad, that tells you that it probably actually means something that matters. Now, again, when we talk about it, we're not talking about if it matters because the value of a person correlates to their score. And to be explicit, Corey and I don't think that everyone should be tested. We don't think that this is like some, it's not a number that's sitting above your head like you're a video game character. It is a description of an inherent property in a person, regardless of their education, regardless of their training or their experiences. It's their inherent aptitude to deal with certain classes of problems in life. That's all. And there are some variables that can affect it apart from genetics. Uh, diet and environmental pollution can have some deleterious effect, but those only work in the negative fashion. So if someone is malnourished or if someone is say, exposed to lead, they will have their IQ diminished as they're growing. And that's a terrible thing. And it's important for us to try to prevent that because we want everyone to be as good as they are as they can be. However, there's not a normalization if you eliminate those factors where they will just magically pop to 100. Because when we think about IQ, we think of 100 being the average. You know, one IQ, the human IQ is 100. That's not the case. Different races have different average IQs. And Asian and European IQs cluster right around 100. Uh, some of the Asian countries are a little bit higher. Uh, in some cases, particularly China, it's now been just demonstrated that that's mostly from cheating and not from actual inherent ability. But there's certainly plenty of, of smart Chinese and, and other Asians. When you get into what is today called the global south, which is something we've talked about in the past, we've talked about the places where when European missionaries began to go in the 1500s, they found demon worshippers in the Americas and in Africa. Those are the places that have catastrophically lower IQs. And five centuries of exposure to the West hasn't changed that because fixing someone's diet doesn't change the inherent nature of the person. So there's a racial element to this that's inescapable. And that's why it's part of the series. It's not just about, well, if, you, if you're taught well or if you're fed right, then you're going to be hypothetically average. You're going to be 100. That absolutely doesn't happen. You will become the average for your race, absent deleterious effects that are reducing it. But otherwise, you're going to average to the norm. You're, you're going to end up where your population group is. And that's why when we're looking at differences in, in people groups, it's something that's important because there are societal and indeed there are spiritual and not there are theological implications to it that, that must be dealt with as well. The best way to describe the interaction of nature and nurture when it comes to intelligence, and this plays out as well in things like height and athletic ability and all sorts of other areas, but we're talking about intelligence today. Nature, which is to say genetics, sets the range. You will fall somewhere within this particular range, and then nurture determines where you fall in the range. And so if you are malnourished as a child, you're going to fall further down that range that was set by nature, set by your genetics. And so the biggest factor is genetics. Overwhelmingly, the biggest factor in intelligence is your genetics, is your descent, is who you are physically. There is some effect from your environment. So you can, as was just stated, wind up less intelligent than you could potentially have been due to environmental factors. If you grew up when there was lead in the gasoline, you are probably a handful of IQ points lower than you would have been had there not been lead in the gasoline. That's just the reality of the situation. We have an entire generation whose IQs were mildly suppressed because of environmental factors. And of course, we have that happening today as well. We don't even know the full extent yet of the impact of microplastics and things like that. Certainly not beneficial, although those seem primarily to make your hormones go wonky, but hormones also do influence intelligence and development. So it's all interconnected. We're not trying to turn this into an episode on environmentalism, but it is related to this issue. And so when we speak of IQs across different populations, it helps to look at just a general map because it 
plays out very obviously. This is, again, one of those cases where you can see the sons of Shem, the sons of Japheth, and the sons of Ham. And the sons of Ham, by and large, are less intelligent. So, for instance, if we look at one of the better countries in Africa, Libya, the average IQ is about 80 or 81. If we look at some of the less good countries in Africa, say, for instance, Sierra Leone, the average IQ is about 45. Liberia, also about 45. Now, if we were to go to, say, Europe, we could look at the Nordic countries. Norway is 97. Sweden is also about 97. Finland's a little higher, 100, 101, etc. We see this play out. There is a general pattern based on blood relationship because intelligence is genetic. If your parents were both extremely unintelligent, very, very low odds, you are going to be a genius. Could it conceivably happen? Sure, once in a billion people. But that once in a billion outlier is not what determines the reality of the situation, not what determines how you manage policy, and not what determines how you proceed with things in the church. Because you have to deal with the average population that comprises your church body, that comprises your nation. You cannot rely on these extreme outliers. Well, there's a potential that we could have this one. No, you can't say just because there's a one in a billion, we rely on that. Because if you rely on that, you're not going to get anywhere. Everything's going to collapse around you. That's you're, you're basically betting like a gambler would. Well, there's a one in a billion chance that I will instantly become a billionaire if I just keep pulling this lever. That's not a good way to run your society. It's not a good way to spend your free time either, but that's a separate issue. Just to give a couple practical examples of how it actually manifests, because again, most most of you listening probably don't know your IQ. And you know, if, if you were tested, it's probably because you were an outlier to some degree in your childhood as you were growing up. And so maybe you got tested, uh, depending on your age, uh, that testing may have actually been part of a government program. Uh, there was a there was a program that was nationwide specifically going after high intelligence people. Uh, it turns out in part to look for psychic abilities. It was it was a DARPA program that uh, 4chan has been chasing down. And I was when when I saw some of the threads that that popped up online, I realized that I had been in those rooms. I had I had worn the headphones. I had uh, been served the little paper cups of the orange juice and done all those things that I'd forgotten my entire life until until I came up. So that testing wasn't simply, oh, let's try to find uh, gifted and intelligent kids. It was, you know, they were looking to potentially weaponize part of the population. But that's just an aside. If you have been tested, it's probably because you're a bit of an outlier or seem like you might be. Uh, probably not too many people who would have been tested because they might be retarded or listening. And when we say retarded, it's not meant as an insult. Uh, that, that's literally a... a it's a psychological category that's valid. Retardation means slowed down, held back. When when something is retarded, it is slowed. It's something you, know, you say that's too slow or too retarded. They're synonyms. So that's why slow is sometimes used as a synonym for less intelligent. We don't say that to be demeaning. It's simply a fact. Some people are slow. Some people are retarded. Um, probably not many of them listening to Stone Choir because we wouldn't make much sense. And the re- reason that we wouldn't make much sense is that both Corey and I are outliers. We are literally off the charts that are used to show IQ. Because if you're showing a population group and you show someone who's so rare that they virtually never occur in the population, you make the chart worthless by including such extreme outliers. So as I said up front, we're not saying we're better at being human beings, but I think that one of the difficulties we have when we're discussing any inherent property of a person is that everyone has these egalitarian priors to say, oh, you think you're better than me. My IQ, when I was tested when I was about eight or nine years old, was 162. It gives me an intellectual functioning range of between 157 and 167. Ted Kaczynski's IQ happened to be 167, so I'm in the same ballpark as him. And I thank God that I didn't have his upbringing because some of the torment that he went through as a child and then the torture that he went through when he went to Harvard is what fundamentally broke him. Uh, Who knows what he would have been capable of 
doing good things if not for the fact that he was horribly abused by a malevolent world. But I think that it's interesting when, you know, a lot of people today talk about Kaczynski's writings when he, you know, had gone off and done horrible criminal things. And when you read some of the things that he wrote about modern society, they seem prophetic. And I think that's one of the tricks when we're talking about intelligence. And one of the points that we hope to get across here is that when you're talking about an intellectual functioning range, you know, I'd said 162. What does that even mean? Statistically, it means that about one in every 56,000 people has the mental abilities that I have. So that's kind of impossible to visualize, but think, how many people have you met in your life? Have you met 56,000 people? Probably not. I think probably very few people have met that many people. So completely at random, I might be the smartest person you've ever talked to. Now, in reality, there's always selection bias in whom we're exposed to in our lives. So you know, if you've gone to universities or you have a profession that deals with more intelligent people, that entire group is inherently biased towards the smarter end of the pool. So, you know, I'm not claiming I'm the smartest person you've ever heard. Corey's smarter than me. I can tell that just by talking to him that he's smarter than me. Maybe you can tell by listening. I don't know. It doesn't matter because the point is that there are ranges of comprehensibility. And I think that's one of the most important things to understand about IQ in the real world. When someone has an IQ of 100, when they're a normal European descent, the relative performance to someone, one standard deviation rate, someone who has an IQ of 115, basically what that means functionally is that if the 115 guy is just kind of loafing, he's doing something, he's not really working too hard at it, he's just kind of doing his job at an easy pace, the man with a 100 IQ can probably do most of that same job if he works his butt off. If he focuses, if he tries really hard, if he pours everything into it, he can probably more or less perform up to the level of a man who's 115, where the man at 115 is just not really trying very hard. Beyond that kind of one standard deviation range of, you know, 10 to say 15 points, but really maybe 10, you can still understand what the man is doing, but you can't do it yourself. And I think that's where our experiences in life come into play. You've probably all met someone who can do stuff that you just can't do. You can't understand how they did that. You know, they, when someone is intelligent enough, they will be able to do things that just kind of seem like magic to you. So that second standard deviation above the first is where that kind of tapers off. There's kind of a there's a, a graying experience where you can't do what the guy is doing, but if he explains it to you well, you can understand it. He can explain it to you like, yeah, I kind of get that, but I can never do it myself. When you get beyond about 25 points or 30 points, you just don't know. You just can't understand what it's like being the other person because their abilities and their experience are so much different than your own that... It kind of seems like if going up, if someone's more intelligent, it seems like magic. And later on, we're going to talk about going in the the less intelligent direction. You just can't understand why they don't, they don't get it. And that's part of why it's important to talk about this and talk about specifics. And that's why I'm talking about the specifics of my own experience, because I said my IQ is 162 when I was eight or nine. If you know anything about IQ, you know it goes down over time. I have had a couple things happen that have certainly diminished that to some degree. It doesn't really matter because I know as myself that 20 years ago, I could absolutely run around circles around myself in some regards today. However, I have also spent 20 years performing at a level and learning and experiencing and developing patterns that give me abilities that I didn't have 20 years ago because I lacked the experience. I had the raw horsepower, but I didn't have the experience under my belt of using it effectively. So I would absolutely put my abilities in most regards up against myself when I was much younger, even though I know that the raw number has probably diminished. That's actually a good point that you made there is to emphasize that intelligence, if you want to look at it, in a way that is comprehensible to basically everyone. 
intelligence is horsepower. So if you have a vehicle that has a particularly great amount of horsepower, and yes, I know that somewhere there will be someone who's a, a gearhead screaming at me for how simple I'm making this, but the point is to make it simple. The amount of horsepower is going to determine how much that vehicle can do. Now, you could have the most powerful tractor in the world. If it's sitting there, it's not any more valuable than a lump of rock. It's not doing anything, but it has the potential to do it. It's in the use that you see the real potential of that horsepower. And it's the same thing with intelligence. You can have very highly intelligent men who do not apply themselves and do nothing with it and never accomplish anything. But that potential is still there. And that person can do things that there is no amount of time, effort, money, resources you could pour into someone of average intelligence to enable him to do what that other man could do. There is absolutely no amount of resources that would make a person with an IQ of 100, an average man, be able to do what someone with an IQ of 180 could do almost without effort. And that is simply the reality of the situation. To bring that back to a vehicle, if you are trying to tow something, picture anything very heavy, a very large boat, whatever it happens to be, you're not going to tow that with a Volkswagen Beetle. You're just not. You can't. It can't do it. It doesn't have the horsepower. A very powerful tractor, very far powerful piece of farm equipment, can do that very easily. That's the difference. This is a very real, hard limitation in human biology. And that's what's important to understand here. There are men who can do things that other men cannot do. And we'll get into that more in the second half, because that's why it's important for the church. Because there are things that must be done in the church that cannot be done by men who are two or three or four standard deviations below what is the European normal. And that's the reason that we're giving some specifics here now, is that for me to say what my IQ is out loud, the egalitarian response to that is typically, oh, you think you're smart? You think you're better than me? Well, let me give you another example. If on the standard distribution, God had given me height instead of intelligence, I'd be about 6'10". Think about this. How many men have you met in your life who were 6'10"? I've never met any. I've been to a couple pro basketball games where I saw some of them, and a couple guys who are a bit taller than that. I have no idea what it's like being that tall. I am perfectly average. Physically, I like God put all of my points in my brain. Physically, there's nothing remotely remarkable about me, which in some ways is luxurious because I fit everywhere and everything fits me. I never hit my head is, on anything. It is quite nice. Yeah. Well, you're taller than me. Yeah, like you're. I, I Not technically much. I'm a man. Marginally. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. We, we're both. We're both near the center of the bell curve, and so the reason I'm bringing that up is that to say I have no idea what it's like to be six ten. Yeah. When you watch basketball players walking around, a lot of times you'll see them ducking. They're kind of they have their heads bent down and they they have kind of a weird posture. That's because they've spent their entire lives hitting their heads on doors and ceilings. I've never hit my head on anything. I don't hit my head on things. I'm happy for that. I don't have to worry about ducking unless there's a really weird situation. The guy who's 6'8", 6'10", 7 foot, 7'4", he has to worry about that. I have no idea what life is like as him. I've never had to struggle with legroom. I've never had to struggle with beds. Like, it's nice being normal because the world accommodates you. It's just, it's, it's built around the, the center of the bell curve. That's, that's how it works. It's actually one of the problems that uh, the military was facing in uh, the, the Korean and around the Korean War when they were building hardware. They were trying to figure out how to, they did a ton of measurements and measured tens of thousands of aviators to figure out what was the average man so that they could build cockpits to suit the average man. And what they found, though, there, there was no such thing. Men would have longer and shorter arms, longer and shorter legs, taller and shorter torsos. And so while some aspects might cluster in the center, when you start looking at the details of matter in a cockpit, they would all cluster independently. Some guys might have average bodies except long arms. 
And so that was the advent of adjustable seats and things, which then moved on into vehicles. And today, like everything's adjustable. It was because of that. It was because although people tend to cluster at the center, there's still variability. So you have no idea what it's like to have an IQ of 160 because it's so rare. It basically doesn't ever happen. There are guys who are smarter than me. There are a few guys who are a lot smarter than me. But the further you get from where I am, for example, the more exponentially rare it becomes to the point that it virtually never happens. If you look at two standard deviations above where I am, there's basically no one. Like there might be one or two guys on the planet at any given point on average. Height works the same way. Like think about if you were 6'10". You could tell if someone was seven foot tall because he'd be two inches taller than you. Like I can tell when someone's two inches taller than me very easily. From down here, a guy who's 6'10 and a guy who's seven foot, they look the same. I can't tell from down here. It's all just way over my head. But they're 6'10, there's seven footers, 7'4, seven there's, you know, I think Matumbo is like 7'7. Seven, seven. Um, I saw a hilarious picture just this last week of uh, Shaquille O'Neal, who was 7'1 in uh, some sort of museum with an, a life-size picture of Robert Wadlow, who is in the Guinness Book of World Records, is the tallest man ever recorded. He was 8 foot 11. And so when Shaquille stands next to Robert Wadlow, he looks like a little kid. I would look like a little kid standing next to Shaquille O'Neal. When we're talking about large differences in the distance and how commonly things happen, that's what it looks like. It looks really weird. So let me, let me give you an example from my life of something that happens to me all the time. When I was in high school, I was in a, a German class. Uh, it was kind of a blow-off class because our teacher was insane. So I, I never learned to like a German. I don't know any German to this day, despite taking several years from this crazy lady. Basically, we just kind of screwed around. Um, I was sitting there one day not really paying attention. The teacher wasn't even around. There's a guy who's a, a friend of mine named Dave, Big Dave. He was a really big guy, sweetest guy in the world, very friendly. Everybody liked him. He was sitting over in the corner. I could overhear what he was talking about, but I wasn't really paying attention. So it's kind of out of the corner of my ear, he was speaking to some other people. Now, I knew Dave well enough to kind of know his musical tastes and a little bit about him. And I overheard him talking about the oboe. Now, what came out of my mouth next was something that I didn't even understand what had happened until after I did it. I heard him talking about the oboe just out of the corner of my ear. You know, I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't focusing on it. I wasn't thinking about it. As soon as he said oboe, I laughed out loud and looked up and said, ha, you like Corey, you like Carrie Johnson. And Dave looked at me like I had pierced his soul. I, the, I will never forget the look on his face when I said that. And I didn't even realize what I'd said. Like, I just heard him talking about the oboe. I said, you like Carrie Johnson. And I then realized that I had outed, like, the girl he was probably madly in love with. What had happened was that I was in band. I played the sax. Carrie played the oboe. I knew Dave's taste in music. I knew that this guy has no nexus to classical music or anything. The only possible reason that Dave is talking about a double reed instrument is he has a crush on a girl who plays a double reed instrument, and her name was Carrie. And so I, I give that as an example because that's what my brain is doing in the background all the time. And like sometimes my brain is like, it's a separate thing. Like it's processing on its own and I'm not supervising it. And so in the blink of an eye, I put two and two together without any conscious thought whatsoever. I perceived a secret, Dave's deepest, most intimate secret, and I outed it without thinking. Like, it was a, it was a cruel thing to do, and I felt, I still feel bad about it, because, like, I, I clearly shocked him. I don't know if I heard him, but, like, it was, wasn't something he wanted me to say in class. And so, like, it was, it was a jerk move. I was a teenager. I was a, I was a dork. But... That is what my brain is doing all the time. It's connecting like lightning, disparate points of data in ways that no one else can see. No one else would have ever guessed. I mean, for me, it wasn't even a guess. I knew it. I knew with absolute certainty that Dave liked Carrie, and I was a jerk, and so I said it out loud. My brain does that all the time. That's the kind of horsepower that God gave me, and more and more I'm trying to use that for beneficial things instead of just being mean to people, but 
most people, like at most, you you may have you know one of those bolts of lightning once in your life, once in a great while. The more often that happens, the more intelligent you are. That sort of pattern recognition to pluck tiny, infinitesimally small signals from whatever's around you and make conclusions that are spot on. You have the tiniest bit of data and you reach an absolute conclusion and you don't miss. That's a level of intelligence that's alien to most people. And so I describe that not to brag or to, like, it, it's not about me. It's just trying to give an example of at a certain level of intelligence, things just get weird. And to a normal person sitting in that classroom, like Dave, I don't know what he thought. He, he probably thought like I was psychic or something. It wasn't it wasn't some divine revelation. I didn't read his mind. I just figured it out. It was it was kind of what Sherlock Holmes did. It was inductive reasoning, and it was free, and it was instant. And that sort of pattern recognition is the hallmark of general intelligence, which is fundamentally what the IQ test measures. So maybe useful to give a general definition of what genius is here. Genius is typically 150. That's what it's regarded as, 150 IQ. Yes, that's not an even number of standard deviations up from normal, but it is half again as intelligent as the average man, as it were. Although notably, IQ is not a linear measurement because someone with an IQ of 150 is not merely 50% more intelligent than someone with an IQ of 100, but that's that gets complicated. But anyway, for genius, it is the ability to draw sound conclusions from seemingly insufficient information. And the reason, as just stated, why someone with an IQ that high can do that is because the information isn't insufficient. Someone with a lower IQ will look at the set of information and go, I can't draw a conclusion from this. But someone with a high enough IQ will realize all of the information you need to draw a sound conclusion is actually there. Now, of course, the, the ultimate example is God. God can draw a sound conclusion from any information. But he has given different abilities to different men, and those with greater intelligence can draw accurate, sound conclusions from less information. As you go up the scale, you need less information to figure out what is actually happening with the set of data you've been given. And so just to give some hard numbers again, to give a, a firmer idea of what is going on here, someone with an IQ of 150, and in case someone wants to reproduce this to verify what I'm saying is accurate, I'm just using the normal distribution function in numbers. It's probably roughly the same in Excel, maybe off by 0.1% or something. But anyway, for 150 IQ, for a white population, which is to say 100 average, average and mean are the same thing for those who slept through math class, a 150 IQ is 1 in 2,331. Not super rare. However, to give you an idea of how the rarity scales, an IQ of 160 is 1 in 31,574. Then we'll, we'll jump up a little bit. An IQ of 180, 1 in 20,741,000, and the change doesn't really matter at this point. And we'll, we'll cap it off with an IQ of 200, let's say. That's one in 76.4 billion. That's for a white population, average 100, standard deviation 15. So you can see how that rarity increases. This is not a linear matter. But now to compare it, and this will be very important for the second half of this, to go back to 150, for an African population, an African population is a standard an average of 70 with a standard deviation of 13. It varies a little bit from one country to the next, but that's close enough to for the whole continent. One in 2 billion 644 million for an IQ of 150 versus for the European population, one in 2,300. You can probably see how this is a problem, how there's a very big difference here. And that continues, of course, throughout the entirety of the IQ scale of the distribution. So if we looked at 180, we actually can't look at 180. And the reason we can't look at 180 is because that number is so infinitesimal that it is zero. 
there are no Africans at that level because the cutoff where it basically becomes you've got 100% of the area under the distribution as far as you've gone out is 174. And that's an absurd number because it's one in, what is that, thousand million, billion, trillion, one in one quadrillion. There are not that many people on the planet and there may never be that many p people. God may come back before there have been that many human beings. And so you have to keep in mind just how few people there are at that end of the spectrum, but also you have to keep in mind just how few people there are in an African population who are only, say, two standard deviations up from what would be average for Europeans. So if we went from 100 to 130, two standard deviations for a European population, not for an African, because again, different average, different standard deviation, for Africans with an IQ of 130, you're talking 1 in 510,000 versus 1 in 44 for a European population. You have to think about how this plays out in your civilization, how this plays out in how do you run your government, how do you run your church, where do you find your theologians, where do you find your leaders, where do you find your mathematicians? Because this is not just a matter of the church. This is a matter of everything. Because intelligence does have direct applicability to almost all areas of human endeavor. Yes, there are some things that intelligence only plays a tangential or a marginal role. But even those areas, for instance, where it is purely brute force, well, those jobs are a lot easier today because intelligent men have made the hardware used today to do them. It's a lot easier to dig a ditch if you have a backhoe and various things like that than if all you have is a shovel. The, the big machinery, the heavy machinery, was not thought up by a man with an IQ of 85. I, I won't give a, a number for what IQ you need to make something like that, but assume it's at least two or three standard deviations above normal. And so these are real considerations that lead to real consequences, and they are not something that we can simply ignore. But to go back to the point that Woe was making about higher intelligence versus average, if you're talking to someone of average intelligence or what it's like to have the, the higher intelligence, there are certain proofs of the existence of God that are extremely convincing. In fact, I would, I would say that if you can understand them, which is the point here, they're absolutely convincing. And so, for instance, there are formulations of the ontological argument that are 100% convincing they are definitive, God exists. However, someone of average or lower than average intelligence probably cannot understand them. And there is likely no amount of explanation that is going to make them sufficiently clear to make them compelling for someone of average or lower than average intelligence. And so there's a natural consequence that flows from that. How do you reach someone with lower than average intelligence with this information? In some cases you can't, so you're going to have to devise a different path to reach these people. But I cannot explain Gettle's incompleteness theorem to an average man. I can't. There's no way I could possibly do it. I can't explain his version of the ontological argument to an average man. There's no way I can do it. And so we're not saying that exceptionally high intelligence is some sort of magic bullet. It's not, we're not actually wizards. There are things we cannot do. There's nothing, of course, God cannot do because God, of course, is infinite. There's a vast difference between simply being an outlier and being infinite. But no matter how high your intelligence is as a man, there will be things you cannot do. And as Wo said, once you get outside, say, three, four, and particularly five, standard deviations difference, the person at the upper end is not going to be able to explain certain things to the person at the lower end of that gap, no matter how hard he tries, no matter how much time he spends. 
And this plays out in society, it plays out in our government, it plays out in our schools, and it does in fact play out in the church. Before we get into the details on a church, I'd just like to give a couple of other small examples of relatability. You know, we're talking about kind of the high end of, of human performance, but outliers are outliers because God doesn't want that many of them around. The sweet spot for intelligence is really about kind of 125 to 130, maybe 135. The reason for that is that a man who's in that range is relatable to basically everybody. You know, if you have an IQ of 125, you can relate to the common man completely. You can He can understand what you're talking about. You're not going to be thinking things that push him too far. You can be a great leader. And if, if you have that sort of IQ, you're probably... You're probably a leader in your congregation. You're probably at a more senior position in your employer, certainly if you're old enough to have, to have risen up the ranks. Men who are equipped in such a fashion by God typically rise to the top. Now, where that is could be anywhere. There are a lot of guys who never graduated from college who, you know, are their machinists or something who are that smart. The reason that it's important that there are those guys is that they're the ones who really move things forward on a day-to-day -day basis. There aren't enough really weird guys to go around, but there are plenty of guys who can keep things moving, who understand things well enough to keep these systems in operation. The flip side of the frequencies, as, as Corey mentioned a minute ago, IQ of 130 for a white man is about 1 in 44 means if you have 100 people, two of them roughly have about an IQ in, the, in that range. That means that if you spend most of your time in rooms with fewer than 44 people, that guy's probably used to being the smartest guy in the room. Now, obviously, there's selection bias in our social lives. You know, if, if you're working at a company where you are that intelligent and it matters for your job, you're probably surrounded by people who have similarly higher degrees of intelligence. So, even if you're not always the smartest guy in the room, most of the time when it's a random collection of people, you probably are. And this is what I would call the midwit trap. Midwit's not 100. Midwit's 130. Because the guys who are in the range of about 130 are used to being the smartest guys in the room, which is a very extremely dangerous experience for anyone to have, regardless of their intelligence. If you get used to being right more often than the people around you, you start to trust your own judgment and you trust disbelieving what other people say. It's not bad per se, but if it, if you become blinded to the fact that there are dudes out there who are exponentially smarter than you, you're going to go after them when they disagree with you. And that's my experience all the time. I can guarantee you every single person who's listening, I have been called retarded far more times than you have. I get called stupid and retarded every day on the internet for saying things that are actually intelligent observations. I don't get called retarded by average men. I get called retarded by smart men because they're probably somewhere in that range. They're used to being right. They're used to being the smartest guy in the room. And when they hear saying someone saying something, they can't understand. Their only experience in life is that someone says things that they don't understand that person must be dumb. They, they must just be a dimwit. How could you disagree with me and say this weird stuff that doesn't make any sense to me unless you're dumb? Because they can't see that there are pages and pages beyond where they are in the book of performance. And so as a society, not maybe not so much in church, but like I don't think that we need the smartest guys in charge of church. I think, think we need the most faithful guys in charge of church. However, you need to be intelligent enough to know that when someone smart is playing tricks, you can stomp on them. And simultaneously, you need to be intelligent enough to know that when someone is smart is saying something you don't understand, maybe they're right. The, the judgment for a Christian is not, is this guy smarter than me? It's, is he being faithful to Scripture? But when you have a line of men who are used to being smarter than you, pastors, probably smarter than most of the people in most of their congregations. We should hope that that would be the case, you know, particularly in the Lutheran church, these guys are expected to learn Koine Greek and to learn Hebrew. Those are not 
easy languages. You know, Greek in particular has some complexities that go far beyond what is found in a superficial understanding of English. Some of those remnants are still there, but unless you're really good at understanding the mechanisms of language in general, it's probably going to be challenging to pick up some of the new concepts that are just a part of older languages like Greek and, and Latin. And that's because men used to be smarter. You know, the the IQs that are outstanding today wouldn't have been as outstanding 500 years ago. Uh, we, we know for a fact that even in the Victorian era, men had at least a standard deviation higher. And you can see that just in letters from farm boys. You, you see letters from the Civil War, and a lot of them are eloquent to the point that even modern readers who are intelligent have trouble kind of understanding what they say easily when it's just a love letter to their, their girl back home. So there's a diminishing overall as a society, as a, as a race of people, in the direction of getting stupider. And I don't know if that's reversible. So when we say that whites, on average, are two standard deviations separated from the average African, it's not maligning them. It's an observation of a demonstrable, provable fact that correlates strictly with race. You cannot move an African somewhere else in the country and magically make them smarter. Just like someone a European moving somewhere else to Africa isn't going to make them dumber. It's, they're, just, they're still going to be European. We are what God makes us. And some of the factors that God builds into us are things like IQ, just like they're things like height. There are tribes in Africa that are extraordinarily tall, and there are some tribes that are pygmies, like they're, they're tiny people. You know, if, if an alien came from another planet and looked at them, probably wouldn't conclude they were the same species. And it's not denying anybody's humanity. I'll just, if you look at the physical characteristics of things and you separate them and say, well, all of these people are seven feet tall and all these people are three feet tall. I'm not sure I would call both of those groups the same kind of people. As humans and as Christians, we're like browbeat and saying, oh, they're exactly the same. They're interchangeable. Well, the seven footers are seven feet tall because that's in their genes. And the same with the pygmies. And the same with the intelligence, the, the diminishing of intelligence in Africa and also in South America. Uh, we're going to, one of the embeds is going to be a map in Central America. The IQs are every bit as in the toilet as they are in Africa. And personally, I believe, as I've said in past episodes, that is a function of their 4,000 years of communion with demons. Maybe it's something else. I think that's the most Christian explanation for it. It's certainly not attacking them as human beings. It's saying, hey, man, we need God. We need God in our lives constantly. And when you commune with demons with, for thousands of years, that's going to have consequences that are passed on from father to son especially when you're talking about cannibalism and human sacrifice and the most unspeakable, unthinkable acts of evil are corrosive on everything, not just on the soul, not just on your lifestyle, but literally corrosive on the body. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not demons that cause them to be functionally retarded. But whatever it is, different people groups in different places have different qualities that are measurable, they're observable, and they're consequential. Uh, one of the one of the embeds that we're going to have is going to be something, maybe you've heard this term before, a green text. Uh, it's from uh, 4chan, I think probably poll. Uh, there's some spicy language in it, and I'm not going to censor it. You can read it and deal with it. It's the internet. It's a, an anonymous post from someone who did research as a grad student on IQ in prisons. And one of the first things in this green text post is something you may have seen, particularly on Twitter lately. The question that he was asking, one of the many questions that he was asking in this study of prisoners was, how would you have felt yesterday evening if you hadn't eaten breakfast or lunch? Now, you've probably seen people maybe recently joking, how would you feel if you hadn't eaten breakfast? That's specifically what this is talking about. The reason that that question is so important is that what was found in that study was that if someone has an IQ below about 90, now, the, you know, these numbers are ranges. They're not absolutes. They're measuring how frequently a given degree of performance appears in the population. What they found in San Quentin, there were a lot of guys with lower IQs. Not really surprising. You know, there are racial aspects to that, and there are also just aspects that criminality may tend to be the only option for someone who isn't given viable options for employment. So, as Corey was saying, like, there's societal implications to this that are also, by the way, Christian implications. Anyway, 
what they found was what you, when you ask that question, how would you have felt yesterday evening if you hadn't eaten breakfast or lunch? If someone has an IQ below about 90, they just break down. They can't process the question because it's a conditional hypothetical. The hypothetical is how would you have felt? You know, and then the conditional is had you eaten breakfast or not? So those two elements combined cause most, if you had an IQ below 90, the responses were things like, what do you mean? I did eat at breakfast and lunch. And then the questioner would say, yes, but if you had not, how would you have felt? To which they would respond, you know, in more vulgar language probably, why are you saying that I didn't eat breakfast? I just told you that I did. This is something that also played out in uh, episode four of The Wire. Uh, it's If you haven't seen it, it's, it's a profane, violent thing. Uh, series on HBO, so I'm not sure I'm recommending it, but I enjoyed it. I've actually, I probably watched it three or four times. There is, in in season four, they were, the cops were doing a program similar to this in the schools where they're trying to find how do they intervene young enough in the students' lives to be able to keep them, to divert them from criminality. And they had a student who was like 16 in a room And one of the psychologists and one of the cops was asking him questions very similar to this. And he became violently angry at the questions, just like in the green text. What he said is, you know, he's cursing a lot. I think we'll we'll embed the clip. And again, you know, it's a content warning. It's it's vulgar, but it's realistic. When When the questioner asked him, how would you have felt about this situation? He got violently angry and said, why are you messing with my mind, man? Why are you doing this? Get out of my head. The reason for that response was that it was breaking his mind. Being confronted with a hypothetical like this, with a conditional, it hurt. It hurt his brain to be subjected to that sort of question because he didn't have the capacity to process it. And it wasn't, as Corey was saying earlier, it's not the case that someone below about 90 IQ, you can teach them how to think about those things. It's literally too complicated. Just like calculus is literally too complicated for some people to understand. It's hard. Calculus is a hard thing. For some people, it's much easier than others, but it's not just sort of a trivial task like tying your shoes. Tying your shoes is something if someone is profoundly retarded, they probably can't even do that. They probably have Velcro on their shoes today because they can't tie them. That's, that's the outer limit of their performance. So their societal and their doctrinal implications to someone that cannot even understand a hypothetical question, which is why this is a Christian matter. Because when you look at the Christian faith, you find that there are a lot of hypotheticals like this. To emphasize the the issue of criminality and intelligence, as an attorney, I know a lot of other attorneys, unsurprisingly. Many of them Many of my friends from law school and other colleagues went into criminal law. That was one of the the common career paths out of my particular law school. And so I have talked to many of them what it's like dealing with either the client or the accused, depending which side of the courtroom you're sitting. And many of these people simply cannot understand why what they did is wrong. You will ask them, how would you feel if someone did this to you and they cannot process it? Because that's a hypothetical. And so all they can say is, well, it didn't happen to me. If they can even manage that. Some of them simply cannot understand it whatsoever. There's no response. They'll get, they will get angry at you, but they cannot understand why you shouldn't do whatever horrible thing it is they've done on an empathetic level, because they don't have that empathy, because they cannot understand, well, what if you had been the victim? And I also did psychology in undergrad, and I did study IQ and things like that, related subjects, but that is the real problem here. You cannot empathize with other people if you cannot understand hypotheticals to some degree. And so there is a lower bound for human empathy. That doesn't mean that everyone with a low IQ is an amoral monster. There are plenty of very unintelligent people who are still decent members of society, but it is because they have been channeled into a proper place for them. 
That's the biggest thing. If you have someone who is particularly subnormal, that person can be a productive member of society and function at a lower level, yes, but still function if he is channeled properly, if he's given a task that is suited to his abilities. If you just turn him loose in society, things are going to go poorly for him and possibly also for others. It's going to depend on whether or not he happens to have a violent disposition. And we talked about that in a previous episode. So if you allow individuals to flood your society who have low intelligence and a tendency toward violence, well, what are you doing to everyone else in your society? What are you doing particularly to the most vulnerable members of your society? And that's why this matters from a societal level, and we'll, we'll be getting into the, the Christian level. We just touched on it on a surface level right there, saying Christianity involves a lot of hypotheticals, because it most certainly does. But on the side of whether or not your civilization, whether or not your society will be able to function at all, you have to deal with these matters. You have to deal with this reality. You have to know what to do with those who are particularly subnormal when it comes to intelligence. Because they're not going to just be turned free in society and function as a man would with an IQ of 100 to 115. If you turn a man loose who has an IQ of 115, he'll probably find his way in society just fine. He'll manage to do something. If you do that to someone with an IQ of 70, he's not going to manage just fine. He's going to wind up homeless or a criminal, most likely. Those are the paths that are open to him. And it is not compassionate, and it is not Christian to fail to recognize this or to ignore it in the name of equality or egalitarianism. You have to deal with reality as it is, not as you would prefer it were. And for anyone who's listening who knows a little bit about psychology, when you heard Corey describing a lack of empathy, you probably thought, ah, oh, that's sociopathy or maybe psychopathy. It isn't really. When you're talking about sociopathy and you're talking about someone who is incapable of empathy, that includes the expectation that if something weren't wrong with them, they would be able to. We're talking about an entire population that lacks the mental capacity. It's not emotional. It's not that they are unfeeling. It's that they're intellectually disconnected from what's right in front of them. And if you've been exposed to some of the horrible, violent videos on the internet recently, they're, they're happening all the time, but we see them more and more. Uh, now that Elon has taken over, they're not getting censored like they used to, which is important because these are actually happening. There is a nonstop stream in the United States of African Americans committing horrifically violent crimes, and it seems to be sociopathic. It seems like they have no empathy whatsoever. They will grab something and they will hit a man and knock him down, and once they knock him down and he's unconscious, they continue wailing on his skull. Like they're, they're trying to completely destroy him. And that's, an, that's a very common reaction. I know that a lot of people follow me for whatever they find valuable in the takes I have on Twitter. I try to keep that stuff off my timeline just because it's so upsetting and depressing. But when I hear these guys saying they're just like us, it's all I can do to restrain myself from just sending them a flood of nightmarish violent videos like that because they're everywhere and it's always black people you never ever see white people doing this to anyone else you see it all the time with black people they don't care who they're doing it to it's, it's a lot of times it's black on white violence but it doesn't matter they get set off and they engage in behavior that seems animalistic it, it's it's utterly detached from anything that we would consider morality you see them doing it and you're like just stop him. Like, even if you want to hit the guy, even if you want to hurt him, he's down. Why would you continue caving his skull in? And yet it's perfectly normal for the entire population to do that when they get angry. Now, as Corey said, it doesn't mean every single individual, but it happens often enough that if you have general intelligence and you can detect patterns, you cannot help but detect that pattern, which was, was the subject of the previous episode. We, we don't need to talk about too much more, but I do want to highlight something. You know, we were talking a few minutes ago about the average 
African population, which is distinct from the African American population. You may notice that I typically go out of my way to say African American. The reason for that is that, one, it precludes those who say, oh, it's just skin tone, which is something everybody wants to say now. The more that race becomes an issue in Christianity, the more pastors who are afraid to speak truthfully will say, oh, it's skin tone. It's just color. It's all superficiality. We're all the same underneath. We all bleed red. Nonsense. I, I'm not going to curse here, but you can just imagine a stream of expletives of me from me directed at that sort of lie. That is a vile, wicked lie to say it's just skin color. If it were only skin color, then African Americans would not have IQs of 85 on average. So that's one standard deviation above Africans and one standard deviation below Americans. Why is that? The reason, and you know, there's been a lot of study that's gone into this. One of the problems with studies today is that because this subject is so politicized, Many of them are getting censored, or they're simply not getting done at all, because anyone who's in the business of securing federal funding or grants for their research, they know how to milk the system. And they know that if they produce a result that says that African Americans do anything worse than anybody else, not only are they not going to get funded, but they're going to get blackballed and they're never going to work again. No one's going to give them money for anything, because that's crime think. The reason I call them African Americans is that that's what they are. They're Africans in America, but they're also part American. Now, I've said before that American is a race. American is a white race. American is synonymous with white. African Americans, on average, are about 25% white. Whenever you do genetic studies on, on a population of African Americans, you'll find that they're, they're a quarter white on average. Some are much less, some are much more. It sort of gets averaged out in the wash because visually, African DNA, the physical characteristics that go along with that, are dominant. So if you have African DNA, you're not going to have, for example, light-colored eyes. It's very rare. You do see it very rarely, but light-colored eyes only come from Northwestern Europe. They don't really come from anywhere else. And it's a recessive gene, which is why it's the only place you see it. Those genes are being wiped out by the admixture with other groups that do not have them. So if someone is three-quarters African and one-quarter American, they're going to have predominantly African characteristics. And because Africa is such a huge continent, there are many light-skinned Africans. There are Africans who have less noticeably African facial features than others. And that's not just, and that's not because they necessarily have admixture in Africa, which means mixing with with another foreign alien population of DNA. It simply means that there's variety. God likes variety. He likes different shapes. He likes different sizes. He likes different looks. It's what he gave us. We don't get to complain about it or insult it. So African Americans have IQs on average of 85. A big, huge, overwhelming percentage of that is because they're 25% European DNA. Now, mathematically, that would imply that they have, you know, a grandparent who is white, but that's never the case. It's almost never the case. What has happened is that they have a number of, you know, great-great-grandparents or great-great-great-grandparents. And so they're all those little bits and pieces, you know, 100, 150 years ago, there was a family secret or it's just lost to time because, you know, there's no, there's no living connection to those people. The DNA is passed on. The genes are passed on. And so a major factor in why African-American IQs are higher is because they have European DNA. Now, 85 is important because, as we just mentioned, it's below the threshold of about 90 for being able to understand conditional hypotheticals. If you've ever, I think I said this last week, if you've ever served on a jury, the, the rules for, for a jury, the instructions that they're given, are filled with conditional hypotheticals. They're complicated. They're, they're, they're based on reason. They're based on logic. You have if X, then Y. If not X, then Z. And you have to be able to process that correctly. It's just assumed by our society that anyone in the jury room is able to understand hypotheticals. The average African American can't do it. And I think one of the biggest problems that the confusion that arises, that we're not saying these people are 
not human. We're not saying that they're bad. We're saying that they lack a capacity for something that we just assume they have. Now, imagine if me, as someone who's four standard deviations separated from the normal man, if I just expected you to be able to do everything that I can do. I can jump to conclusions so quickly and no one even knows what happened. I, I can remember a time when I was working in a, a company and we were sitting around, we were discussing a number of issues and they handed out a piece of paper that had one of the issues on it. And I scanned it in 10 seconds and I said out loud, well, this is a no brainer. And one of the guys in the room, his name was Dave. He's a very smart guy. He was actually hurt. He was shocked and offended that I said that. And he's like, whoa, hold on. We need to talk about this first. I don't, even if you got it, everyone else needs to understand. And so we spent like five or 10 minutes going over the thing in detail and they were yammering back and forth. And eventually they reached the conclusion that I reached in 10 seconds. That's my experience pretty much all the time. I look, I know, I move on. If I were to hold you to that standard, it would be vicious. It would be cruel. It would be insane. And it would just be utterly unfair. That's not the gift that you were given. And I can't just say, oh, you're stupid. Why don't you understand? No, I don't think that. I, I, I try to be charitable, but I know some people take more time. Now, in, in that case, I was in a room with a bunch of really smart people. Like the average IQ in that room was probably 130 plus. And so I just wasn't thinking. I was just relaxed and saying, well, this is, this is easy. This is an easy one. Like I wanted to move on. I wanted to get out of there and go home. And yet it took five minutes for everyone else to, to struggle through it. And they did struggle. I can remember that specific problem. They, they had a hard time processing what I got like a lightning bolt. And so the reason that I, I've given these examples to try to contrast my experience with your experience is that your experience does not mirror the African-American experience. They don't process on average that quickly. Of the, of the 40 and a half million African Americans in this country, six and a half million of them, 13 to 16% have IQs of 100 and above. So almost all of them are below 100. When you get to 85, it's nearly half. 19.9 million have IQs below 85, which you know is what we say is about half. What that implies is that although they have verbal ability, they can talk to you. They, like, they seem like normal, decent human beings, and I'm not saying they're not. I'm not saying they're not normal, decent human beings. What I'm saying is that your normal experience of being able to process things is different than theirs. And I'm trying to suggest to you that it is cruel and it is unusual and it is impermissible for us as Christians to impose on a group of people an expectation to which they can't live. And frankly, we, we see this all the time in society today, and a lot of times it's called wokeism. You'll say, IQ tests are racist. They'll say, expecting people to show up on time is racist. Expecting people to do math is racist. Expecting people to, to do math correctly, to say that three to the second power can either be six or it can be nine, depending on your, your cultural expectations. We, as normal whites, we see that and say, that's insane, that's, it's woke, it's crazy. They're calling things racist that are, in fact, racist. Not in the sense that they're hateful, but in the sense that they are based on race. And when someone has an IQ of 85 and they can't understand hypotheticals, and you tell them to do things like consider the future, which, by the way, is a hypothetical, it's not fair. You're trying to expect them to do something that they're not able to do. It's like trying to expect someone with Down syndrome to tie his shoes correctly. He can't do it. Rather than insulting and calling names and degrading or the opposite of saying, no, you can do it. You're just fine. You're just like me. You can process this just fine. Well, that's not true. If someone is incapable of understanding something you're capable of understanding, it is not kind to lie to them, to gaslight them, to say, you're just like me. You can get this. Well, they'll never get it. And we see a lot of anger from this population in part because they're being tasked with something impossible. And it is on us who understand better than them what's going on. And what we see in society is the exact opposite. This demonic world that Satan is ruling is telling our churches, it's telling our pastors, it's telling our laity, no, you're all completely the same. You all have the same ideas, the same hearts, the same souls. You're all completely interchangeable. They can do exactly what you can do. If you believe that, 
then of course I'm a, I'm a monster for saying this. I am the only evil thing in the world who's saying these people can't do exactly what you can do. What I'm telling you, in contradistinction to that, is that in fact, a subset of those people, a sizable subset, can't do it. And no amount of yelling at them or encouraging them or lying to them is going to change the fact that they can't be taught to do something that they're not capable of. Back when the LCMS was a more serious church body, we produced a pamphlet called Helping the Retarded to Know God. It was published in, I think it was 1969. And today, to modern sensibilities, to some ears, that's going to sound atrocious or at least perhaps silly, but it's not. And it is of a kind with very early on, Lutherans became very concerned with how do we reach the handicapped? And there are a lot of different handicaps that will play into this issue. For instance, Scripture is very clear. Faith comes from hearing. Well, how do we reach the deaf? They can't hear the Word of God. And so Lutherans set up schools for the deaf because we wanted to teach them so that they would be able to receive the Word of God in another way. Because they can still read as long as they're not both blind and deaf. And then, of course, if they're blind and deaf, well, that's why we have Braille and other things like that. But for those who are mentally retarded, this is a very real concern. Because as was stated, much of the Christian faith is phrased, is worded in hypotheticals. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you have faith, those are both hypothetical statements. Those are conditional. If, then. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, then you will spend eternity in paradise. Almost none of that statement is comprehensible to someone with an IQ below 80 or so, because you have made it conditional. If this, then that. It's a hypothetical, because it has to do with the future. It has to do with, if you do this condition, then that thing will happen. It has to do with eternity, because you're speaking about eternal life in paradise. It has to do with paradise, which is a hypothetical. All of these are things that are not comprehensible to someone who has an IQ below 80, perhaps below 85, but at least below 80. How do you reach that man with the faith? How do you teach him the faith? How do you ensure that he has faith and continues to grow in the faith? These are real problems for the church. And these are things that are simply swept under the rug and ignored by those who want to say, no, we're all equal. Everyone has the same capabilities. And if you just try hard, you'll be able to achieve it. And that's not the case. As stated earlier, there are certain things that no matter how hard you try, no matter how well you understand them, you will never be able to instruct someone below a certain level of intelligence. And that is the case with the faith. There are certain things about the faith that someone with an IQ of 85 or lower will never be able to understand. You are not going to give him a dogmatics textbook and explain to him the communication of attributes between the divine nature and the human nature. You will never be able to explain that to him. That's not to say this person cannot be a Christian. As we've stated multiple times, those who are not very intelligent can make excellent Christians if they have faithful pastors and faithful congregations who recognize how you reach that person. If you treat him as if he were just any other man with a standard IQ 100 to 115, if you treat him like that, you may very well damn him because he is not going to get the faith in the way that he needs to hear it in a way that is understandable to him. Yes, certainly, if he's at least in the service and hears the word, we trust that God's word does not return to him void as he promises in Scripture. But you should be able and you should be attempting to reach these men where they are. God, at the very least, permitted them to be that way. Yes, some of this is, of course, a consequence of the fall. So to say God simply made you that way is accurate, but not entirely. Because 
obviously through the corruption of original sin, we see these defects creeping into human nature over time. But you have to take that into account. Because if you treat him as a normal man, you are actually doing him a disservice and you are being disloyal to God. You are not doing what you have been called to do as a Christian. It's the same thing as if you had a particularly slow child. If you have a mentally retarded child, you do not put the same burdens on him, you do not set the same expectations for him that you would for a child who is average. That would be cruel. And as a parent, you should understand that. But it's the same thing in the church. Because the pastor is supposed to care for the sheep. If you have a sheep with a broken limb, you don't just wander off, have all the sheep follow you, and then, well, the one with the broken limb, he'll eventually waddle over and make it. No. You have to bind up the limb, you have to heal that, you have to carry him if necessary. You have to account for the capabilities of the people in your congregation, and that is not being done today because it goes against our public civic religion, which is just, again, it's the slogan of the French Revolution with particular emphasis on egalitarianism, on equality. And as Corey reiterated from the beginning, and I want to say one more time, we're not saying that these people cannot be Christian. African Americans have for a long period of time, ever since they were brought here as slaves and their slave masters forced them to be Christian and taught them the Christian faith, many of them have been faithful Christians. That was God blessing them, even in the face of adversity. It has nothing to do with receiving the faith. However, this has everything to do with propagating the faith. Because one of the requirements for pastors is to be apt to teach. Who is capable of teaching? He who has mastered a subject. It's not enough to simply regurgitate. It's not enough to know a few things. To be a teacher is to have mastered the subject area sufficiently that whatever question arises, whatever error arises, perhaps there's no question, but there's a problem that you need to address because someone says something out of left field, only a pastor who is apt to teach is equipped to do that. Now, when two-thirds of the African-American population has an IQ at or below 90, meaning that they cannot typically handle, and by typically I mean 95% of the time, handle hypothetical conditionals, are they going to be able to propagate the Christian faith among themselves? The reason this is a pressing issue for our church, particularly the Missouri Synod, is that it is the stated goal of President Matt Harrison and the entire St. Louis Seminary staff, and probably many in Fort Wayne as well. It's the general view of the Missouri Synod that while for the last hundred years the Missouri Synod has radically embraced using contraception to prevent God from giving us the blessing of children in marriage, we've we completely capitulated that. A hundred years ago, it was illegal, and the church condemned it. And then I think the Anklins jumped ship first, and we immediately followed. And today, if you speak out against any form of contraception, as a pastor, you may well get run out of your congregation. You're certain, certainly going to lose people, because a lot of the people in your congregation are practicing it to some degree. If you want to be married and you want to have sex, God will sometimes give you children as he sees fit. You don't get to decide, I want the sex, I don't want the babies. It's a package deal. If you want neither, don't get married. If you want one or the other, you get married and you get both, according to God's goodwill. Contraception interrupts that. It says, nope, I want part of it, I don't want all of it. It's really no different than fornication, where you say, you know what, I don't want the marriage, I just want the intimacy. I want the fun, I don't want the obligation. Contraception is just another variation on that same thing. And so the Missouri Senate embraced it radically. Most of our pastors have, you know, maybe one or two kids. A few have seven, eight, nine. You can tell who's practicing contraception and who isn't. Whether they preach against it or not, when their entire family takes up at least a row, you know what they're practicing. And that is a testimony to their faith in God. And it's something that should be said publicly and explicitly. God blesses those who obey him. And we've talked in the past about how Protestants are allergic to being told, hey, if I obey God, good things will happen. Well, try to find a page of the Bible that doesn't say something to that effect. God promises that. 
He promises punishment to the wicked in this life, and he promises blessings to the faithful for being faithful. He also promises suffering. I'm not saying everything's going to be great. You may do everything right and be barren. That happens too. If that's God's will, embrace that cross and use it for your own personal edification. But that's not the norm. Just as being exceptionally brilliant or retarded is not the norm. Most people get married. If they don't contracept, they have kids. They have a lot of kids. That's how God designed us. That's how he designed everything. The Missouri Synod embraced interrupting the creation of families. We then embraced sending all of our girls off to college as well as the boys. We then embraced those colleges ceasing to even be Christian colleges. So you have multiple effects of not having babies, destroying local congregations and local families by sending everyone away, and then destroying the faith of the children of that congregation by not properly catechizing them. And by that, I don't mean catechesis before they're confirmed. I mean everything that they're taught. If you're taught that that obedience to God and the participation in the church is just this optional thing, yes, of course they're going to fall away. And we see all of those things in massive numbers. The LCMS is actually getting older year over year. We're, we're aging as a population faster than we're literally aging. That means that the apostasy of the younger generations is continuing to accelerate. So we're losing souls, not even to death. They're not being claimed by God in heaven because the boomers are dying. They're being claimed by Satan's world because they see no reason to come to church anymore. Because why would they when their churches aren't about God in the first place? Sure, they have the sacraments and, you know, there's preaching, but it's not preaching against those things that the people need to hear. It's not telling them what they actually need. You need more than the forgiveness of sins. Lutheran heads explode when you say that, but it's the truth. The forgiveness of sins is the beginning of the Christian life. It's not the end. The cross is, yes, the beginning and the end of your Christian life, but only because everything that flows from it is a blessing from God. Your justification is the first blessing from God, and then all the good works that he gives you for the rest of your life in view of the cross are also gifts from the same Father in heaven. We cannot ignore one and expect to keep the other. And that's what we're seeing in the numbers. It's what we're seeing in the pews. You look around and you see nothing but gray hair in most of our congregations. The reason this race thing matters is that Matt Harrison in the St. Louis Seminary, their plan for reversing this decline is to replace the European-American population of Lutheranism with foreigners, with Africans, with Turks, with people from anywhere in the world except for us. One of the things that all those people have in common is substantially lower IQs to the point that they're beneath the threshold of being able to even comprehend the more complex parts of the faith, never mind propagating it. And this is why this is a gospel issue. It is one thing to teach an African-American or anyone, anyone to teach them the faith. Anyone can be taught the faith, no matter how low their IQ. IQ does not, doesn't keep you from God. Babies, you know, they, I don't, they effectively have no IQ. In the womb, they're, all they can do is hear. They can't even think in any, com- in any way that we can understand. And yet they can receive faith by hearing. If you're a pregnant mother and you're sitting in church every Sunday, your baby's already a Christian because your baby is hearing the word of God through your belly. Faith comes by hearing. It doesn't come from understanding. We are not gating the faith on intellectual assent. What we are saying is that comprehension is the only way that the faith can be propagated. And if the synod succeeds in deracinating our churches so we get rid of all the white Europeans who are out of fashion with the world— It's not cool anymore. We're 96% white as a denomination, and that is a matter of profound shame for the men in charge. They despise it. Whenever they talk about it, it's with venom. Is that not how God made our denomination? Is it or isn't it? Did God make these 96% white population Lutheran? And the smattering, it's like half African American and half others. Great. I'm glad that they're here. As we talked about in the Shaking the Dust Off Your Feet episode, we have tried for over a century to reach out to the African-American population. We've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on black colleges. They failed. They all failed. They worked a little bit for a time, and then they died. They died because African-Americans do not want to be Lutheran. 
And so these guys think, well, the solution is let's be less Lutheran. It's more important for us to get Jesus in front of these people than, than to be Lutheran, which is a false dichotomy. Being Lutheran is putting Jesus in front of these people, whoever these people are. I don't care what their race is or what country they're from. I care about the fact that the proper proclamation of the gospel, the proper proclamation with all of the gifts that we have been given in our doctrine must come from someone who can properly express it. And if Matt Harrison and all of his flying monkeys succeed in replacing all the white men that they don't want to see in these positions anymore, they're going to be replaced by people who, by and large, are less capable. We're seeing this in every industry. In fact, in Harvard, in medical schools, in the military, in the airlines, they are systematically replacing whites specifically, replacing whites with other populations, with minority populations who are less intellectually apt. I, one of the charts I'm going to have is going to show the absolute numbers. We talked about percentages, but absolutes matter too. There are 40 and a half million African Americans in this country. How many black people do you think have IQs above 115? The answer is 1.2 million. There are 1.2 million African Americans today who have IQs above 115. Now, that's kind of the minimum threshold for being able to do anything useful in business. It's not nearly smart enough to be a scientist. It's not remotely smart enough to be a doctor. But that's the entire pool of all available African Americans for everything. 1.2 million people. Now, if they're smart and they're not Lutheran, and you know, maybe they're not even Christian, what are they going to do? They're going to pursue wealth. They're going to pursue fame like everybody else. I don't fault them for that apart than from the fact that it's worldly. It's not a particular sin of that community. It's what our entire culture is built around. 1.2 million people is all you have who are apt to teach anything remotely. That's the pool that the, that the Missouri Synod wants to replace us with. We're talking about this because it's not going to work. It is guaranteed to fail. It's mathematically guaranteed to fail. And the reason we're talking about something that's so controversial and upsetting, and we're telling you something that you can't see and you don't think is real, is because it's one of the things that God has equipped Corey and I to be able to do. We can connect these dots that no one else can even see. You may be able to connect to, to add 2 plus 2. I can add 2 plus 2 by inferring the existence of one of the twos from what's going on in the environment. And I can imagine that the other two is the only possible solution to the problem. I don't need either two to connect two plus two. You may need God to hand you both of them. You say, yeah, two plus two is four. The ability to comprehend these situations is something that's not given to every man. The reason that Corey and I started Stone Choir and the reason that we're talking about these issues that are upsetting and they're divisive and they make people uncomfortable is that if... Matt Harrison and the Missouri Synod and all these other places, all these other churches, it's not just about Lutherans, but they're our chief problem. If these men succeed in driving the whites away from these positions and replacing them with African Americans, how many of that 1.2 million who are even remotely capable of doing these things are going to be in those positions? The answer is basically none. You're not going to be able to maintain the same, same standards that we have and replace us with them. I'm saying us and them specifically, not because they're not Christians, not because they're not brothers in Christ. I do not deny that. I'm thankful to God for giving them faith. What I am resisting and what I am objecting to is the notion that we can be wholesale replaced just as we are in our countries, just as we are in our, the, plan, the lands that we have. We're being replaced in our churches by those who tell you, oh, it's fine. They're Christians too. They're Lutherans too. It's all going to be exactly the same. Lutheranism will be dead in two generations if we go away, because there's not going to be anyone left who can even understand the Book of Concord. It's just that simple. If you pick up the Book of Concord and you start flipping through it, there's going to be stuff in there that you have a hard time understanding. Imagine if you're, you know, a standard deviation lower. It's Imagine if you don't have the ability to understand hypotheticals, you open that book, what are you going to see? You're not going to be able to read it. And that's what our church is facing, and that's why we're talking about this. That's why race is something that matters in the church. Because yes, you can receive faith by hearing, that doesn't mean you can teach it to others. If you have a friend who's a Christian who has Down syndrome, 
You love him as a brother in Christ, but you don't ask him theological questions. That's wisdom. That's not cruelty. On the point of the the Book of Concord, the best example would probably be the Solid Declaration, which was written by men with IQs probably in the 140s, 150s, addressing other men in a similar range. And as was mentioned earlier with the numbers, you're not going to get that if you replace Europeans with Africans. That population simply does not have those individuals in it. There are two populations that currently exist among humanity that have even the potential to maintain Christianity for any length of time. And that is Europeans, which includes Americans because Americans are of European descent, and East Asians, Northeast Asians. However, across generations of effort, we have made very minimal, if any, inroads in Asia. Now, I know there are those who are going to mention, well, no, today there are millions of Christians in China, and there are some Christians in Korea and some Christians in Japan. There are some. There's a lot of syncretism and other problems. But that small population over that period of time, because don't forget this has been centuries of effort, it's never been self-maintaining. It's never been self-sustaining. And the odds are that if it did not have Christian support from outside, it would be crushed by the government inside of a generation. Of course, we see that happening in the West now as well. But the bottom line here, and the reason this matters, is that there is no church without white Christians. There is no church without Europeans. That doesn't mean that there wouldn't be a church for a time. If all Europeans disappeared today in some strange version of the rapture, which is false, of course, but we'll get that at another time, but if we were all to disappear, the church would continue for a period of time. But inside of two, three, four generations at the most, the church would die. And everyone in areas that today have churches would return to animism, to syncretism, to paganism. And we've seen that happen. We've seen areas in Africa where Europeans have withdrawn. The areas were Christian, and they've gone right back into animism almost immediately. And the reason that's going to happen is that you are always going to have men at the top who are intellectually gifted by God running things, answering the questions, being the administrators, the administrators, etc. If you remove those men, well, something, someone else, with those capacities, with that ability, will take their place. And it's going to be demons, because there's no one else to fill the role. And that's what we've seen happen all over the world. If you don't have the capable men at the helm, demons come in and say, well, sure you're worshiping God, but shouldn't you also worship this saint? Shouldn't you also worship this tree? And over time, you become a syncretist. And then eventually you lose the elements of Christianity entirely, and you're a pagan again. That is exactly what will happen without Europeans. And it may be that men with an IQ of 115, say, could sustain a church for a time, could keep it going. That's certainly the case. Neither one of us doubts that. But can those men answer new challenges? Could those men have written the Book of Concord? Could those men have produced the creeds? Could those men have answered any number of challenges in the history of the church? The answer is no. Because the intelligence behind those who are going to bring the challenges against Christianity, the diabolical intelligence, is going to be greater than those men can handle. They will not be able to contend with it. And so even if you have the materials on hand to address many of the issues in the history of the church, and we do, we certainly do, we have great writings from many church fathers, we have the Book of Concord, we have great materials. You, one, have to have men who can read them and understand them, and then teach them, and that requires a certain level of intelligence. But you also need men 
who are even more capable of that, who can answer the new challenges that face the church. And that is the problem we have today. We have that problem because we have many faithful pastors. The LCMS in particular has many great parish pastors out there who are doing their duty day in and day out, working 60-hour weeks, keeping up with their parish, following up with shut-ins and all of the things that they do day to day. But those are not the men who need to address the problems we face today. Those are not the men who have that task. God doesn't give the task to them. Other men whom God has given the ability to do that have to address those issues and then teach the pastors and then the pastors teach the parishioners. That's the hierarchy. That is how it's supposed to work. And if you replace the white European population in the church with others, you will lose the ability to do that. You will first lose the ability to address novel issues. You will second lose the ability to address issues that have already been addressed because you will have lost the ability to understand the materials, and then you will lose the faith. That is why this issue matters. That is why we're fighting for it. Because if those who hate the heritage that God has given to the Western Church get their way, there will be no church on earth in a hundred years. I'm going to emphasize that again so that we're both on record saying exactly the same thing. Satan wants to destroy the church. He always has. Christianity will die without white people. It may not die out completely, but the spread will die. I know that there's some who will say, well, what about Ethiopia and Sudan? Yeah, what about them? They preserved a small remnant of Christianity. I haven't really looked into their doctrine. I'll assume for the sake of charity that they're actually Christian. I don't have any reason to believe they're not. I think they're a little weird, but fine. Who isn't weird at this point? They never evangelized anyone. They were in Africa. They never evangelized any Africans. It took white people to evangelize Africans. It takes white people to sustain Africans in the faith outside of Ethiopia. And by the way, those Ethiopians are descended from Solomon, at least those who have preserved the church there. So even that is a racial church, and it's not African in the way that most people think. Satan wants you to believe that race is not real. He wants you to re believe that race does not exist, that we are all fungible. He wants you to believe that any man who tells you differently is evil and must be excommunicated and destroyed, which is something that both Corey and I are facing for saying precisely these things. The reason that we're talking about race at all is not because we care. It's not because we think it's interesting. We've said that repeatedly. The reason we're talking about IQ is not because we care or we think it's interesting. We're talking about these controversial, upsetting things that have probably upset and alienate some of you are listening right now. We're talking about them because as men who are so much smarter than you that you can't even understand what's going on in our heads, we're telling you with all of the fervor that we can muster, if you continue to deny that race is real and that it matters and that white people have been the kernel that has, that has kept Christendom alive for 1,500 years, by our attributes, it's a gift from God. And to make clear, we're not saying, oh, we're great because of this. God is great for giving us these gifts. God is great for making me as smart as I am. And I was a jerk most of my life. I wasted it. I used it on selfish things. I'm trying to change that now. A gift is only as good as how it's spent. And if it's despised, it's, it's a gift that's wasted. We are not taking credit for the good things that whites have done. God gets the credit for the good works. However, no one else in human history has ever done it. And based solely on IQ aptitude, as Corey just mentioned, only white Europeans are capable of preserving the faith as we know it today. The, the Christian church will die. At this point, all we can do is try to warn people that Satan is, he's on the verge of winning. And the fact that our own churches are burning down men like us for the sake of destroying racism, in, in their words, next week's episode is going to be about racism and what a fictional sin that is and why it's being weaponized against Christendom. The reason that these are issues is that Satan knows that all he has to do is take us off the table and it's over. 
because whatever tiny remnant has existed in Ethiopia or India or all these other little gotcha exceptions that you Redditors have, they're nothing. Not in the kingdom of God. They're important souls to God. I'm not minimizing that. They've never in the history of the Christian church done anything to spread the faith. That only happened after the apostles went out in Europe. It effectively happened virtually nowhere else that, we've, that we know of, which means it didn't happen because that's recorded history. This stuff matters because the church will die if we capitulate to the world. And I'll once again say, if your morality is coming from the mainstream media and it's in perfect lockstep against the things that we're saying, and it's in lockstep with the vile statement that Matt Harrison put out last week, if that's your morality, it's identical to CNN's, if you think you're getting it from God, it may have mercy on your soul on Judgment Day, because that's not where it came from. The fact that we are outnumbered and that we are despised doesn't mean we're right. There are plenty of people who are outnumbered and despised because they're awful. And that's an easy thing to sell to people who are suckers, especially if you're used to identifying who's correct by being in the majority. For Lutherans who are listening and Protestants in general, that's the claim that Rome has. They said, we have over a billion souls. We must be the church because look at all the people who agree with us. Numbers don't matter. Opinions don't matter. Scripture matters. And Scripture is not at odds with anything that either Corey and I have ever said on this podcast. The more that our adversaries listen to our episodes, the more they agree that we're doctrinally sound on everything except for the one or two things that they want to attack. And race is chief among them. Ask yourself why that is. How can the men who hate us and want to see us murdered admit that we are sound Christians who are smarter than them and who know the Christian faith better than them? How did we get this one thing wrong? How is it the only thing that we're getting wrong? Why are we the only ones talking about it? Because we will be destroyed for talking about it. And if you believe and you talk about it too, you'll also be destroyed. You'll be destroyed by the Missouri Synod. You'll be destroyed by your own church body, whatever it is. Because Satan is holding the reins to all of them. He has CNN. He has the Purple Palace and Missouri Synod in St. Louis. He has most of your church bodies too. There's nowhere to hide. And we're talking about these things because what else can we do? All we can do is tell you the truth. And like I said, I've been called retarded and stupid for decades. I'm used to it. I don't mind it. I, I feel bad when it happens for the person who's saying it because I know that I'm not going to be able to reach them. And I just pray that someday they'll believe me. But the days are running short for this. So if you believe me, if you hear me now and believe me later, it might be too late. The reason that we're talking about this uncomfortable subject is that if our churches capitulate, if they participate in the white replacement that's happening in every European country that's being welcomed with open arms by virtually every denomination of Christianity today, if that succeeds, there will be no Christianity in the 22nd century, which means that there will be no 22nd century. The end, the end is near. God is going to come and he's going to end all of this because I don't see any other outcome. That's my personal opinion, but I think if you, if you read the parts of Scripture that talk about end times and you don't find these things playing out in ways that they have never played out before, I hope you'll just spend more time in the Word, because our faithfulness is being tested, and the things that God says about those who are faithful in the last days apply to you too. If, if you believe us, if you don't believe us, look at Scripture, and you may find that you must mistrust your pastor as a result of that, which is a terrible thing. I don't want us to have to mistrust our pastors. The ideal case is a church where the people are sheep, they're believing, they're like children, and the teachers are shepherds who are faithful. That is the ideal circumstance for the church. We don't have that. We have some moderately clever sheep, and we have some moderately dumb pastors, and we have both of them embracing the lies of the world. This is very likely the final battle for the church, and that's why we're talking about it, even knowing the, the Missouri Synod right now is trying to dox me, to hand me over to Antifa, where I will face physical jeopardy for saying these things, for speaking out against the CRT, the Marxism, in the large cataclysm. Matt Harrison wants to see me physically destroyed, and they've called the police, and they have ton they've taken measures that are utterly demonic. 
if you think that that's good for the church, okay, I'm not going to try to change your mind. But if you think that a reaction like that to someone simply talking about Scripture, even if our ideas are weird, even if, even if we're wrong, if you think that it's a natural reaction from a church body to seek the physical destruction of critics, you're wrong. It, it, it's evil and it's demonic. What Matt Harrison is doing is evil and demonic. What the, the presidents, the council of presidents, all the district presidents, all six vice presidents of the Missouri Synod, who all signed their names to his wicked email, his wicked statement last week, all of them are guilty of this evil because they're doing nothing to stop it. I have God on my side, so I'm not worried. Corey has God on his side, so he's not worried. We knew when we began this that we would be hated for saying these things. Why would we do that if we were lying? Do we think that we're scoring points with whom? If we're defying God and we're making the whole world hate us, what's the upside? What's the upside to a man signing up for destruction and then damnation? Why would a man do that? You know, that's one of the principal arguments for those who say that the martyrs of the early church who would proclaim Christ even to the point of being executed for it. Why would those men have lied for a lie? We're not martyrs, not in the same sense, and I, I hope it doesn't come to that, but if, if it does, if I get killed as a result of Stone Choir, and you hear about that, because, you know, the Missouri Synod will dox me when it happens, maybe think about that. Why would the world want me dead for saying these things? I hope it doesn't happen. It's in God's hands, so I'm not worried about it. I'm not, I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm just saying these are the stakes. They're the stakes for the church. It's not about us personally. It's about the fact that if we do not prevail in preserving true doctrine and the true faith, we're handing Christendom over to Satan, and there's not much Christendom left. So we're seeking the preservation of that which God has given to us. That includes our blood. It includes our faith. It includes our homelands. It includes every good gift from God. We have a duty to him to preserve those things. And if the world hates us for it, we should welcome that. And if you're afraid to be hated by the world for the sake of telling the truth, you need to think about what God says about that, because all of these things are bound together. This is all the same argument, and it's all the same war. And in the end, we're going to all end up before the same judgment throne. We'll be standing side by side. And those who cried out, Lord, Lord, and did not serve him will be cast into fire. And those who said that they did nothing, but they were wrong, if they had faith, they'll be preserved. Those who are seeking the destruction of those who try to preserve the church, I'm thankful that God is the judge to sort those things out, because I don't know, I don't think, it, no, no man knows what, what he could do at that point. God knows. And God is watching all of us. He's watching you. He knows what you're doing, and he knows what you're thinking. He knows what I'm doing, he knows what I'm thinking, even while I'm pseudonymous. I know I'm not hiding from God. I might be hiding from the Missouri Senate who's trying to kill me, but I'm not hiding from God. There's no hiding from the Creator. What we do in these last days will determine how we are received in heaven. And that's something that you should keep in your heart. Christ's blood covers your sins, but if you despise him, where does that cloak go? You can cast that cloak off. And there are many in this church who are casting off the cloak of Christ's righteousness for the sake of amity with the world. They want friendship with the world. They want to have good arguments. They want good articles in MSN and not bad ones. They want to be welcomed and loved and not criticized by people who hate Jesus Christ. I love Jesus because Jesus first loved me. God first loved each of us. Our response should be love for him, and that should be a willingness to face even death for the truth. So if you would choose safety over truth, you may have a peaceful death, but your afterlife will be one where that's also judged. I, I pray that everyone who's in the church today who's still remaining will remain faithful in these last days. And I hope they're not, well, I hope they're the last days, but if they're not, then that's up to God. So I don't, my my days end when God ends them. I don't, I don't care how it comes out. What we do matters because God has given us things to do. What we confess matters because God has told us the truth. And if we lie about what he's told us, that will be counted against us. And so we'll end with a 
short passage of Scripture, just to bring it back to the Word of God and prove that this is not something new that we're saying. This is not surprising. God knew this from the beginning, of course. And so Genesis 9, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. We are Japheth, and the tents of Shem, well, that's the church. <laughs>